Remember when KLF burnt £1 million on a remote Scottish island? Has the Universal Audio Luna recording system that's just been announced tickled your fancy? Is there any gear you're lusting after that's on your want slash wish list? I will be doing podcasts this year. Could you talk a little about your creative process? Perhaps it was inevitable that you were underwhelmed after I bigged up the expanse so much. There's also what you call legal precedent. Uh, have you had a chance to use Bitwig's new micropitch features in anger yet? Did anything on all the NAM updates catch your eye? Uh, any updates on your live performance rig? No. If I remix a popular song, but I never intend on releasing it, uh, can I play it live? I think that's a silly thing to say if you understand the history and heritage of Mo. I, I just don't want to earn dirty money. Hey guys, welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. It is Friday, it's time for another Ask Me Anything. Usual rules apply. Uh, comment anything you want below this video and I'll get back to you in next week's video answering whatever questions you have. Before I get on to last week's video, a uh, house admin, what is there I need to mention? Uh, so, Sonic Academy, I have done a course on my Dead Mouse remix, I think I mentioned it last week, uh, that's now done and sent off, so uh, as soon as I get a, a date for that I'll let you know. Uh, in other, <laughs> kind of sad but kind of with a positive end news, uh, the I, for long time followers of this channel, or at least followers of over one year, uh, you may or may not remember that last year um, I was part of 300 or so other DJs in trying to break the Guinness World Record for the biggest back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back set. Uh, so uh, mate mine Dan who organised it and it was all set up for, for charity in Manchester uh, with all the proceeds going to uh, a good cause. Um, Unfortunately, the Guinness record has now been retracted. It turns out that one of the DJs, the absolute idiot that he is, I don't know who he is, so I can call him an idiot, uh, and it's probably a good thing that I don't know his name, uh, played two tracks in a row and therefore didn't do the back-to-back -back rules and therefore ruined it for 300 or so other DJs and whatever else. Uh, so that's very annoying. However, they're doing a version 2.0, uh, which will be this April, again in the same venue, Joshua Brooks in Manchester. So for any of you guys watching this who are local to Manchester uh, and are free in April, uh, I'll confirm dates and everything closer to the time, obviously. Uh, it's still a few months away yet. Um, but yeah, so that's good news that we're, we're doing it again, basically. Uh, round two. Uh, I think that is it. I've not updated the tonal display playlist uh, this week. But I have been building up some tracks uh, ready to put in there. Uh, so again, link will be below this video. Uh, if any of you want some amazing music, in a playlist on Spotify, then follow the link below this video. Um, Hackintosh video updates, there aren't any at this point. Um, so for those of you that are Patreon members, again, link below this video. Uh, if you pay whatever it is, $10, you get a bunch of loops packs and stuff like that of mine. Uh, and it's the only place in the world you can get those loops packs. I will be adding another loops pack or two to that list uh, shortly. So uh, again, thank you very much to my Patreon subscribers. You guys get it first. Um, but I'm putting together a Hackintosh series of videos uh, for you as well. Uh, that's obviously taking a bit longer than expected. Uh, mostly due to the amount of, of money coming into the Patreon, so it's kind of out of my control because I'm just spending the Patreon money on 
putting those videos together. There we go, that's that. Um, I think that is it for house admin. So let's crack on and have a look at last week's video. Uh, get yourself a coffee, sit down and enjoy the ride. Or not. Uh, Deadly Custard, talking about art and music. Uh, remember when KLF burnt £1 million on a remote Scottish island in 1994? That's a very specifically remembered date. Do you remember the, it being specifically 94? I remember it being the 90s. Uh, quite an interesting story when you read into it and hear about people's reactions to it. Uh, it didn't go down very well, largely, and also their own later reflections. I'm pretty sure there was a documentary done by someone, I can't remember who. Uh, there was certainly no apparent financial gain in that piece of art. Uh, there is a neat little four-part uh, programme interview about it uh, from the time on YouTube called Why Did the K Foundation Burn a Million Quid? Uh, worth a look for anyone interested. Yeah, I think, I'm sure it was on BBC or something a few years back, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, have you heard the latest? Uh, they are building a pyramid of bricks made from human ashes. Yikes. Uh, no, I haven't heard that. Is that real? Is that a real thing? Okay. Uh, I mean, well, there we go. So on the million quid thing. Yeah, I remember that happening in the 90s. And I remember it being on the news and I remember most people being pretty much outraged by it. I remember hearing on the news, you know, they'd interview some obscure artist who would think it was a fantastic thing to do and whilst I can understand the art and I can understand the objective and I appreciate that I also feel like it was potentially missed out a missed opportunity to help some charities or something. I, I just, so I, I wasn't 100% comfortable with it, I must admit. Um, but whatever, it was their money. They can do what they want, really. Uh, as for the pyramid of bricks made from human ashes, that sounds horrendous. Um, I, yeah, okay, I'm going to need to look into that. I need some more information. Um, yeah, interesting. I just hope that they do it with good reason and intentions and results uh, but there we go andrew hollis mix down high five talking of mix downs has the universal audio luna recording system that's just been announced tickled your fancy i've not i've got to admit i've not looked into this uh, so i i don't honestly know mostly because i don't feel i need a recording system i have a workstation i have a decent uh DAC I don't I don't I, I'm not I'm not in the in the market for a, a recording system and I, and I think it's also universal audio stuff generally I find is catered more towards studio engineers who record rock bands and stuff like that I have you know live instruments and humans I I don't think they really cater much towards the the electronic producer uh so based on that and that's maybe that's wrong of me i don't know but that's kind of why i don't tend to look at the universal audio stuff other than the fact that they're massively expensive as well um i had up until very recently the uad2 uh dsp card in my mac pro tower um and i loved it you know i i hands down it was it had some of the greatest uh VSTs that I'll ever use, uh, or plugins of whatever sort they weren't VST. Um, so I'm not anti Universal Audio, but I, at the same time, I kind of understand that they're not really catered towards us um, and they're incredibly expensive. So uh, that kind of pushes me further away, really. Uh, However, I've I've seen someone, I saw someone post about the Luna thing not so long ago and I kind of just looked at the, the headline, whatever it was, and went, meh, and moved on. So, uh, so no, it hasn't tickled my fancy at this point. But if any of you guys watching this think that it maybe should, then by all means chime in. Uh, the steel versus imitate debate reminded me of a uh, quote good artists copy great artists steal yeah i can't even remember who uh, who came up with that um 
I feel like it was probably someone like Prince, but it wouldn't have been Prince because he's too egotistical and up his own ass for that. No, I can't remember. Anyway, <clears throat> St. Nicholas, mixed iron, high five. Hey Dom, avid viewer from the start. Is there any gear you're lusting after that's on your want slash wish list? Yes, the Moog One is on my want, need, lust list. Uh, what an absolute thing of beauty. Uh, in an ideal world, I would love to go for the 16 voice one, but I mean, we're looking at about, is it five grand or something? Um, you know, I'm incredibly lucky that I am endorsed by Moog. Um, I'm an endorsed artist by Moog and have worked on presets for some of their synths. Uh, so I'm honored that I've been in that position. So there's a good chance that I would have some sort of a discount, like an artist discount type thing. But even still, it's, it's, it's a lot of money to front for a synth. Um, I'm sure it is worth every single penny, but I just have other things in my life right now uh, that have to take a higher priority than uh, than a Moog, uh, unfortunately, uh, and that's just life. Uh, other than that, I not really. So I've seen a couple of things in Nam. I saw the twenty six hundred. I kind of went, ooh, I wouldn't mind a twenty six hundred. Uh, and again, then I saw the price, and I thought, nah, I could buy an original for that. Um, not quite, but uh, I just get put off by some of the prices of these things. I get that, you know, uh, especially to rebuild an old machine, if you're going to do it properly, then it's it's going to cost a lot in uh, R&D. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's the whole wants versus needs argument. And I think, you know, we as music producers, um, I think all of us, get gear lust and you know we see people with stacks of gear and we just think oh that looks great um you know lots of uh, shiny lights and and buttons um whereas actually we don't do we really need any of it not really uh so yeah so i'm i'm as i get older i kind of i mean you know in my early 20s when I was first working a day job and whatever I was spending all my money on music equipment or or vinyl or whatever it was um, whereas I think as I've gotten older I've kind of just realized actually you know what I blew a lot of cash on a lot of equipment that I didn't really need uh, so yeah so I'm kind of getting to that age now where I'm like okay there's a there's a couple of synths that I really want the Moog One absolutely i'd love to to have a moog one um and i and and i think you know i could justify that sort of money as well because something like a moog one first of all i know i've talked about moog a lot before um where even just the packaging things are delivered in it, it just it's it's an experience from start to finish um, but not only that I actually think the Moog One is is a very, very, very usable synth. It's certainly for someone like me that enjoys the tangible hardware, and I like to be able to feel synthesizers and work with them. And uh, it, it's it's an overall experience. It's not only that, but they're incredibly functional. I've always talked about the uh, uh, you know the, the Sub Thirty Seven being amazing for the fact that, uh, and therefore the subsequent. Uh, 37 because of the amount of potentiometers and buttons on there uh, you know you've got a button per parameter and uh, that makes the workflow just much much better uh, anyway uh, so yeah there we go that's my lust uh, have you recorded any podcasts yet no but I'm <laughs> inching my way closer it is still on the cards everybody I will be doing podcasts this year um so what happened this time was, if you remember, I went to ADE last year in Amsterdam and it turned out that just, it, it, it didn't happen. It went wrong, basically. Uh, I then penciled in a couple of people around just after Christmas. So beginning of this year, I penciled in a couple of people that are local to me here thinking, right, let's get a pilot or two done and so we can fiddle with gear and work out what works and what doesn't work. 
And if you remember, I was also Christmas just gone going to record a Christmas special where I was going to be sat in front of uh, our living room open fire and Christmas tree and whatever. Uh, and I set up the lights that I'd bought for the podcast and they turned out to be horrendous because they were super bright LEDs and they, they just they basically whitewashed my face and then the background was pitch black and I couldn't even though I got a couple of them I couldn't get it working it just looked terrible um so I worked out I then needed some diffusers uh, I have oddly enough last week bought a new diffuser um and I now need a clamp I've realized to clamp the diffuser to the LED but the diffuser works well so I'm getting there I'm getting there uh these podcasts will happen um it's just difficult because I want so I mean the end goal is essentially to have a sort of a, a studio a base where all of these will be filmed however I'm doing all of this on on a shoestring budget and because of that I'm having to buy equipment that I can take with me to places. So, for example, I, you know, I, I was aiming to film some at ADE last year, so I had to take it all in a suitcase. Um, I'm not so bothered about size because most of it will be in the UK. Uh, but that's kind of where it's gotten a bit tricky. And I and I, I think once I'm up and running, then it'll be OK. But I've also had to sort of plan in um, locations of where to film. And so I've actually found a company that run some studios in lots of cities around the UK uh, that all seem to look the same inside they're like rehearsal spaces again I don't know how appropriate that's going to be because obviously I don't think we can record a video next door to a heavy metal band rehearsing so I don't know again how realistic this is going to be but there's a lot of uh, going into it so you know obviously my dream I keep sort of saying is is the, the ideal would be a, a, a music producer version of like the Joe Rogan podcast. Um, while that's a great dream to have, clearly Joe Rogan has, you know, a, a, a huge budget and a, a huge following. Uh, so he's able to rent uh, whatever he has, a beautiful studio with fantastic equipment and whatever. So it looks great and it all just comes across very natural. Uh, the reality of my podcast is that I don't have a budget anywhere near that. So I'm having to sort of uh, bodge stuff and DIY it. So um, it's just going to take a while to get up and running, but it will be happening. And I want to guarantee, I reckon I can guarantee that it will, the, the season one will start this year. Uh, so there we go. Do you use any of the Roland Cloud instruments? No, I don't. I, I don't use... I was going to say I don't use any Roland equipment at all, but I've got a JV1080 behind me. Uh, Muz1903, mixed down, high five. Hey Dom, love these AMAs. Could you talk a little about your creative process? On average, how long do you spend on a track, both in terms of hours spent in the door and actual calendar time, days, weeks, months, from your initial creative idea to the final mix down and master? It's a tricky one. It's a good question, but it's a tricky one to answer because it's kind of different every time. So I think if I if I look at a, not necessarily average, but typical experience would be. If I have a creative idea that I think is good and I'm in the right mood. I reckon I can typically finish a track within a day near enough i'll do some tweaks and some changes i'll sleep on it obviously whatever but basically the, the main bulk of a track i can do from you know let's say 9 a.m to probably 3 p.m i reckon is is a typical kind of if everything's in the right place the right time the reality of that is not always the case and this is where it becomes difficult because there are times where I might throw down some chords or a melody or a musical idea or a drum beat, whatever. I, I throw something down, an idea, a, a beginning of a, a, a track at, let's say, 9am. And by 10am, I've done 
nothing additional to it. And I'm kind of sat there just listening to this one loop round and round and round. And I'm thinking, I, I'm just not in the right frame of mind. This isn't happening. I'll close the project, move on to whatever, um, you know, being self-employed. There's always admin I can do or updating websites or social media or whatever. There's stuff I can do that maybe isn't so creative, uh, that doesn't require so much concentration or whatever. Um, and then I'll come back to it or I'll maybe open up another project where there's a brief and it's a bit more specific or whatever. Um, so I think it's all about the creative moment really and and this is where it becomes difficult and I've 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 said before where uh, one of the first years I was self-employed um, I went to get a or did get a Christmas job in a bookshop which I loved uh, it was only part-time I think it was well I mean it was the crisp Christmas period so I think I was doing maybe like 4 p.m to 8 p.m I'll say three days a week something like that and what I found was that actually had a huge impact, a negative impact on my music production. Um, there was nothing I could do about it. I, it was my first year of being self-employed. I had to go get a job to get through Christmas. It was, that was, uh, you got to do what you got to do. But it did definitely have a negative impact on my music production at that time because I felt like you you can't just choose to be creative. So let's say, for example, I'm making these hours up, but let's say my shift started at, what did I say, 4 p.m. Um, then I had to leave the house at, say, 3 p.m. to get there for 4, which meant I need to be showered and everything by, say, 2 p.m. and eating food or whatever it is. So I've got, let's say, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Well, you can't tell yourself, right, tomorrow morning for at 9 a.m. I'm going to be really creative until 2 p.m. And then I'm going to go off and do a, a shift wherever. Um, yeah, that's not how life works. You can't plan to be feeling creative. So, uh, again, this is why I sort of talk to people about music theory being really important. Because if you understand music theory, you can kind of just tinker with musical ideas without trying to create a whole track basically so sometimes that kind of helps um so again going back to my personal experiences uh on average how long do you spend on a track both in terms of hours spent so uh, yeah so like i say a typical track if i'm if everything's in the right place at the right time i can get a track done in a day let's say uh what will happen on average is I will get that track mostly written in that day and then I'll spend maybe half of another day. A couple of days later, I'll sleep on it because I don't I don't ever want to call a track finished in one day because it I could sleep. You know, I could wake up the next day, listen to it again and go, oh, that's terrible, um, which has happened. Um, so I'll maybe come back to it a few days later and then. I'll maybe spend a few hours tweaking bits here and there and I may have thought, oh, well, actually needs, you know, an extra melody here or it needs another breakdown here or the arrangement needs redoing. There's going to be something or, or some just tidying up. Uh, so typically for when I'm in the zone, I would say let's call it a whole day, you know, let's call it 10 hours. However, uh this is where it gets more complicated is those days probably happen maybe once a week, once a fortnight, even maybe even once every three weeks where you have a day where you just blitz through some tracks. The rest of the time you're kind of slogging hard, um, you know, because I'm not the most creative person in the world. It's, you know, and I've learned to accept that, um, you know, I'm not some, creative artistic genius so it's, it, it, it takes hard work and a lot of effort and a lot of hours so the reality is maybe uh you know because i'm i have a lot of experience things get quicker and that's i think also worth mentioning so let's say for example i get a brief from a client who wants a track in such and such style or whatever um you know, I've still got to start a track from scratch. I can just about get one done in a day sometimes if there's a solid brief and I know where I'm going. Um, but it takes a lot of 
effort and a lot of concentration and uh you know it might overlap into two days or whatever so it's 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 kind of tricky now then it comes to the reality so for example uh for long time followers of this channel somewhat recently i've spent the last year or two slowly putting together an album um and that probably gives you a good idea to get 12 tracks into an album as a complete body of work has taken me over two years so far and i'm still not at 12 tracks i had it at 30 tracks at one point but then whittled it down to 12 and then still wasn't 100 percent happy so a lot of it gets thrown out or used elsewhere or whatever um so yeah so in terms of actual calendar time that can be quite tricky because again some of my job is working to a brief so i have a deadline i've got to get this stuff out in terms of my own artistic work let's say for mousetrap I mean, look at my mousetrap outputs. You know, last year I put out an EP, a remix, and maybe one single. So it really is not a huge amount of work. Um, elsewhere I did a couple of remixes for other labels. And I think that was about it. But again, I've been working on my album a lot. So... Um, in terms of, uh, I'll give you an idea with an EP that I've done for Mousetrap, I may write it and then it will come out four, five, six months later. So there's a, 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 a long run up as well uh, between the initial creative process. So writing a track that I'm happy with that I think, right, this is for the EP. And let's say I'm doing a three track EP. One track is going to take me at least a week because I'm going to keep coming back to it thinking, does this work with this track and whatever. So that's three weeks of work in total, in calendar time at, at the very least. Uh, that's when I know I'm aiming for a three track EP. Um, and then that's going to be another month maybe of me pitching it or just tweaking it or whatever. And then we get a release date, which is probably maybe another two months. So it's, yeah, it's going to be at least four or five months between writing it and having it released. Um, yeah, I think that's probably about as specific as I can get. It's really tricky to, to answer those questions. I, I'd love to give more examples, but um, I, you know, it, it's kind of tricky. So like I said, with, with my album, I've currently, I'm, I'm really happy with eight tracks now. Or was it nine? Whatever. I've got to do three or four more tracks. But I have to kind of wait for that creative moment, especially because now the pressure builds. The more tracks you do for an album, the more important I feel it is that the ones that fill in these gaps now, these next three or four, they really need to sit in a certain part of the playlist. They need to transition. They, the, the whole body of work needs to tell a story. So it, it's getting more and more pressure uh, to get the right sound so um, you know I may have started hundreds of tracks but finished a few so um, yeah do you work on one track at a time until it's finished or bounce between several tracks uh, so if I'm in that creative flow that I mentioned earlier and I'm just in the zone I'll just work on the one track at a time uh, it, it, it's it gets messy and pointless to bounce from one to the other. However, if I'm not really feeling that creative element, I'm kind of looking for inspiration at the same time. So sometimes I might have four or five projects going on. And I'll open up one and, and just do something and then open up another one and go, oh, I'll tweak this here. And then I might open the third one up and go, oh, actually, I'm loving what I've just done here. And then I find my creative flow and then I get into it and, and I just stick to that one track and then move on. And then I might go, oh, actually, I'll use that element, whatever it was, in this track and tweak it again and whatever. Uh, so I'm, it, you're kind of always chasing that inspiration and that creative moment, I suppose. Um, do you finish every track that you start and roughly what percentage of your finished tracks uh, actually do you feel happy enough with to release? I'm just going to hit reset on the camera before I answer that one. So, yeah, I think I've mentioned this before. I would say, and I worked out on average, I probably finish 10% of the tracks I start. 
for myself. And of the tracks I finish, on average, I would say I release 10% of those. So if I, for every, so for every one track I release, I started probably a hundred tracks. Part of that is, like I said earlier on, I'm not a creative genius by any stretch of the imagination. It takes a lot of hard work. And if that hard work means starting a hundred creative ideas and only finishing one or only being happy with one, then so be it. That's what it takes. Um, as well as that, I'm incredibly fussy as well. So, uh, however, I'm lucky that I do production music for uh, TV and film stuff um, and for publishers. Uh, and I also write to briefs for clients as well. So lucky for me, having those 99 tracks that didn't get finished or, or 90 tracks that didn't get finished and nine tracks that are finished but didn't get released, um, you know, I can use those as sort of starting points or templates for another project, basically. Um, or again, you know, if I'm doing some sound design, some loops, packs or things like that, then I can sort of use bits of it sometimes uh, if I haven't used loops in the tracks themselves. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that gives you a long and complicated rambling answer to your question. Uh, Kavake, mix down, high five. Uh, lol, ah, uh, no way. Uh, perhaps it was inevitable that you were underwhelmed after I bigged up the expanse so much. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was underwhelmed. I and I and I wasn't expecting to fall in love with it straight away. To be honest. Uh, so one thing I will say is, my expectations are so easily swayed on these things. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, Inception. I heard nothing about that film in the run up to its release. And then I heard everyone on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, saying about how amazing it was. And it was so complicated and so deep. And oh, my God, I'm going to have to go back to the cinema and watch it again. It's incredible. So I was going, oh, wow, this this film's going to be amazing. In my head, I must must have been building up this I don't know, an inception of Inception films. Um, and I, so I went to the cinema, watched it and just came back completely underwhelmed because I felt like well, that wasn't half as confusing as any as everyone was telling me. I, I, I understood it. There was no that wasn't confusing at all. Um, and so I find I, if somebody hypes up a film loads, I, I really struggle to enjoy it then because I'm, I'm expecting it to be life changing. Um, turns out Inception, I watched again five, six years later, loved it. It's a great film. And I thought, why did I not enjoy this? And it must have been because other people loved it so much and hyped it up so much. I just maybe I expected something different uh, which is the exact reason why uh, every single Star Wars movie that that has come out during my life uh, I have been to the midnight screening of because I need to be front of the queue so that I don't hear other people's opinions because if everyone tells me it's terrible I'm expecting a terrible film uh, if everyone tells me it's amazing I'm expecting an amazing film so there's that caveat however uh, with The Expanse and any kind of sci-fi series, I feel like I never really get into them at the beginning anyway. So I'm kind of not expecting that, no matter how much you bigged it up. Uh, so I wouldn't worry too much there. Uh, anyway, I must admit, it took me a while to get into it. Uh, and things uh, like the uh, Belter Creole... Creole? Uh, were grating before the context became clearer. Uh, that's the... Uh, OK, yeah. The second episode is a bit slow as well. However, the end of the first episode was a shock episode was a shock and sets things up nicely. Do you mean the end of the first season? Uh, and I find it intriguing how the series handles some of the realities of living in space. Apologies if it turns out to not be your bag. After all the fuss, though. Uh, yeah. Again, not a problem. Generally speaking, sci fi series. I was talking to a mate of mine the other day who has also been banging on about the expanse for ages to me. Uh, and I was telling him about it and I was saying I I kind of never really got into sci-fi series that much. So I liked Next Generation. Uh, do you know what? I watched some D 
Deep Space Nine, but never really got into it. Uh, the same mate I was just mentioning, uh, Lee, who he also got me to watch Battle, Battlestar Galactica. And I kind of watched maybe a season or so of that and just I, I just wasn't feeling it. So I'm I'm not I'm not expecting huge things with The Expanse, but people do keep telling me it's good. Also, just to be clear, I don't think artists should earn money for what they do quite the reverse, but I maintain that money shouldn't be the primary motivation. Your own approach is what I strive for. Uh, my grab. Well, I'll be honest, I money's in that motivation. I I just don't want to earn dirty money, if that makes sense. I think that certainly as I've gotten older, I, I feel like there are lots of people in this well in this world not just this industry who will degrade themselves beyond the point of recognition for for not even money sometimes just for fame under the pretense that it would somehow get them a better life and i don't it's not something i understand uh you know, I'm talking about the the everything from the Jeremy Kyle end of the spectrum. Sorry if you're not British, um, but uh, what's the American equivalent? Uh, Jerry Springer from that side of reality TV up to the the the. I'm going to say Love Island. I've never watched it. I've never seen. Oh, actually, no, I did. No, I heard a clip once. Someone was talking about with Brexit does that mean we won't have any trees or something uh, was the clip that was getting played on the radio uh, which is probably a good example of of what I don't understand about these shows and their existence it's just uh, I, I feel that's that's the the complete opposite end of the spectrum where it is purely just money and fame that they are seeking and it doesn't matter how you get there. For me, I, I, okay, I'm not really interested in fame. And I'm not hugely grabbed by money. I would like some, sure. Uh, I'd like to be driving an Alfa Romeo, Giulia Quadrifoglio, sure. But, uh, you know, I'm, so long as I'm happy in life and my family are happy and comfortable and safe. That's the important bit for me. So that's what really drives me to to do the work I do. Uh, and I want to be able to retire one day, possibly. Uh, and I want to be able to look back and go, you know, what? I'm pretty proud of the stuff I've done, you know. Uh, and I think so far, I'm mostly proud of most of the work I've done. Of course, I've taken the odd job where I've then looked back and gone oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that you know that wasn't the best choice but I think that's life and I think you know I, I, I don't think there's anyone on this planet that hasn't ever thought that about something in their life so I'm not you know I don't let it bother me uh, so yeah so Oh, sorry. No, <laughs> now I've just realised I've misread your comment because I've said you've said I don't think artists shouldn't double negative. I didn't even see that. So, right. I'm with you. Definitely. <laughs> so I also double negative. Don't think artists shouldn't earn money. Therefore, you do think artists should money earn money for what they do. Uh, yeah <laughs> okay uh but i maintain that money shouldn't be the primary motivator right we're both on the same page here yeah uh your own approach is what i strive for makes sense now uh, my gripe is with the cynical mercenary attitude in which uh in much of the music industry the parts that are more industry than music yeah i kind of feel like that most industries have that e even in the arts um i think that's true for most arts to be honest because let's be honest, where there's talent, there's quite often some money. And where there's money, there's definitely some greedy people. Um, yeah, so that's, it's kind of annoying. But it, I, I think I've just developed an ability over the years to just, I don't know, turn a blind eye to it and just go, well, that's, the, that's them. That's them doing their thing. Um, you know, from, from DJ's 
having their name stickered on a private jet pretending they own a private jet or whatever it is they do to you know the whole instagram culture uh you know as much as i so sort of, i look at my instagram and i think i enjoy taking photos i should probably do more on instagram but at the same time i don't really care for, about the likes or whatever uh it's, it's just not something that motivates me um i don't understand that part of the industry uh the legal recourse is for where the original artist's ip is so infringed upon that their income is at risk not to provide an opportunistic source of income for ip trolls yes but there's also i'll add to that um and so I could be wrong here, but there's also what you call legal precedent, which so uh, for those of you that just tuned in, we're talking about uh, intellectual property um, and copywriting music and the whole, you know, uh, the fact that there have been some artists in recent years that have been sued for stealing a musical idea when actually the musical idea wasn't really that much of an idea or it or in some cases blatantly different um you know and there's that whole sort of where do you draw the line thing which i think is a good question and an interesting discussion point but you've got to remember legal precedent comes into play here as well so i'll give you a a, a vague but obvious description of an example if somebody used a mouse head that had some vague similarities to the mickey mouse logo disney logo whatever if disney weren't to attempt to sue then they are setting a precedent that means other people can also use a similar head that kind of looks similar to the Disney logo. And then Disney can't really tell. The point being is they can't go, oh, yeah, you're OK, you're allowed to do this, but then you're not for whatever reason. You know, they can't turn a blind eye to one and then threaten legal action on another. So while I'm sure some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, um, I could kind of understand the case there, not that the case was had any grounds, but that the case had to exist. I feel like if Disney hadn't threatened to sue, then they couldn't threaten anyone else to sue for any other reason. So I, I, I hope, and I don't know this, I could be completely wrong, but I hope they didn't actually want to sue the person in question. Um, to my understanding, they just kind of have to show that they tried and failed so that they can then try again with someone else if it ever crops up again. That's my understanding of it. So when it comes to things like music IP, it's kind of a tricky one because if somebody wrote a track, let's say I wrote a big hit today and whatever, it was great. Um, if somebody then wrote something very, very similar six months later, and it sold equally well and it damaged the sales of mine then i absolutely have a right to to sue but if i don't sue and then someone else does it again six months later do i really have a leg to stand on if i didn't sue the first one who did it so it, 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 I, I i think that becomes a, a a tricky thing basically uh when it comes to legal recourse uh so there we go uh the current system is broken perhaps some kind of artistic tribunal system might work better i yeah but i guess we're well i mean no because we're dealing with law so it should be legal people dealing with it i hate to say that because obviously what we'd really like is a panel of of uh independent musical judges but when is that ever going to work in this world you know uh yeah it just it just wouldn't work would it uh anyway i think i'm probably just uh rehashing some of the what i wrote last week i'll stop banging on about it there we go uh question time uh, have you had a chance to use bitwig's new micro pitch features in anger yet it wasn't angry i was more than happy for them to do it 
the new vocoder is also turning out to be quite fun and useful. Have you used that too? Uh, no to both of those things. I've actually just been flat out working on projects uh, the last few weeks. Um, so I, I have, I've not really had a chance. I've still got these three or four blank spaces in my album that I'm intending to fill. And that's where I tend to get a lot more creative and a lot more just I play with stuff for the sake of playing uh, just to see what I get in the end. So that's where I'm going to be looking at the micro pitch and uh, I didn't even know they had a vocoder so I'll, I'll have a look at that as well. Uh, finally, did anything on all the NAM updates catch your eye? So I mentioned earlier on the 2600 did... Um, there was something else as well. Although on that 2600, uh, I'm sure Behringer have now announced they're doing a 2600 clone or something as well. So uh, when I mentioned earlier on the 2600 being a lot of money, I'm guessing the Behringer clone won't be. Uh, any updates on your live performance rig? No. Uh, I So I, I play a festival every year, uh, a, couple, a few hours down the road uh, in Herefordshire. Uh, for the Wartone Records crew and I had kind of wanted to have my album done by now so that I could then prep for live stuff and then play the album live at that festival. Whether that happens or not, I'm cutting it fine now, so I I don't know. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a small part of me that's kind of just given up on doing the whole live performance thing. Um, yeah, just because I've got too much on my plate. Uh, have a great weekend and cheers for another great AMA. I look forward to them every week. So do I. Thank you very much. Uh, not Your Human. Uh, we are getting there, by the way, guys. I know this is going to be a long one this week. Uh, not Your Human. Hi, Dom. Love the video. Thank you very much. Uh, question. I'm a bit of a Joyride fan and see some videos of him performing on stage. And there are a couple of tracks that he seems to have remade. The song This Is America and given it the Joyride treatment, he prob will never release it, uh, but he can play it live. What are the legal rules to that? Uh, if I remix a popular song, but I never intend on releasing it, uh, can I play it live? Also, what about royalties on that tune? Uh, so, there's kind of a weird one on this. So I'll give you an example. Um, when it comes to music copyright, You've got master copyright, which is the final recorded version of your track. Uh, that is the exported WAV of your track. That is copyrighted and owned by usually the record label uh, and yourself, obviously. And then you have the writer's copyright, which is usually registered with, in Britain, PRS, with America, it'd be ASCAP, uh, with Europe, I can't remember the European one. No, can't remember, but whatever it'd be, your 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 uh, your royalties people, um, and that's copyright of the written idea of of the notes, basically in that order or whatever, and the melody and the lyrics and all of that. Um, so, if a DJ plays your recorded version live let's say then technically there are royalties assuming the venue it's played in uh, has a license to perform music live then there are royalties in that uh, because there is you know somebody performed a copy of your song so you know your lyrics and ideas and beats and melodies were presented to a large crowd therefore it's a performance therefore there are technically royalties due um Providing the venue has a license, they don't need your permission to play that necessarily. Um, although I think you do have a right to revoke permission, but it's defaulted permission to my understanding. Um, however, if they are to play a live version, and this is where it gets a little bit weird because the original recording, the, the royalties really are owned by the record label in terms of sales and things like that. Uh, so they may need the record label's permission as well to perform it. Whereas if they're playing their own version, the record label master rights uh, are irrelevant because there is no master recording being used. You're just, you're just using the creative idea, the notes and the lyrics and the melody. Um, so that's where it kind of becomes a bit different. 
Um, so in terms of bootleg, it's basically, so long as you're not using samples from the original master recording, then it is just purely a cover version. Um, so to give you an example, I did a version of Underworld Res. Uh, so I contacted the publishers that owned the publishing rights to that, which is the creative idea side of it, because I'd rewritten all the instruments. There was no, I hadn't used any of the original track in there other than the musical idea and the sounds uh, that I recreated. So it's technically a cover version. So I contacted the publisher, got permission to then release it, and it got released last year. Oh, that was another track I released last year. Didn't mention that one earlier. Uh, so yeah, there we go. If I remix a popular song but never intend on releasing it, can I play it live? So yes, you can play it live in a concert or whatever because it's not a recorded version then and you're not recording a version. So under the, 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 the rules of playing live, um, however, that venue should be licensed and that song should be registered as being played uh, to whatever the uh, local jurisdiction is for PRS in Britain or ASCAP in America, whatever. Uh, it should be registered that you played a cover version there. Uh, as for uh, royalties, they are achievable, but again, it depends on who your publisher is and what cuts and how many people and what time of day and what location. And there are so many things. So in festivals, for example, you can get you know, anything from a couple of dollars to it for your track being played to like a hundred dollars. It, it really depends on which place and where and uh, it's so complicated. I tend not to follow it to be honest. I just tend to just think, well, if someone does, they do. If they don't, they don't. Uh, so there we go. Uh, I can see FanFan87 has replied to that saying, you can play remixed bootleg songs live. Uh, look, for example, Eric Prids playing some unreleased Jennifer Lopez remixes or the police bootlegs. Um, I would be somewhat dubious. You, you're not necessarily wrong, but bootleg is different to remix. And also if they're using original vocals and things, then master copyright does come into play. But someone as big as Eric Prids, who's going to stop him? Uh, so uh, I think it's not as simple as that. I don't think you can just play them, but but you can in a live venue. And this is the tricky bit is, but if you record that set and then play it on YouTube or upload it to SoundCloud or whatever, now you've just infringed copyright law technically, but then it becomes the question of who's going to stop you. Is it in your benefit or their benefit and all of that. So it's this whole gray area that, you know, some people, some record labels will just let you get away with it because it's helping them, basically. Um, so, yeah, there we go. Uh, moving on. FanFan87. Saludom, uh, McGregor and Mixdown. High five and high five. Uh, about an idea for the 100th AMA. What would you think about a full uh, a mix? A full Dom Kane unreleased will never be released tracks. Uh, so, potentially. So, I did do my lots of IDs in a row for Mousetrap. That is now publicly available. Uh, the only problem with this idea is because I'm working on my album, I don't know if I would have enough tracks that are unfinished and unreleased that aren't on my album, because if they if I used all my album ones, I'd basically just be giving away the draft version of my album, uh, and I'm not sure that would do me any favours. Uh, I saw a Sebastian Luger tweet uh, a month ago talking about Moog, saying, it's time for Moog to embrace the digital world, especially with VCO and wave shaping, so we don't always end up with the same triangle square waveforms. What do you think about that? I think that's a silly thing to say if you understand the history and heritage of Moog and of Dr. Uh, Robert Moog himself. Um, so they've literally only just gone polyphonic and for good reason, because they felt they hadn't cornered the world of monophonic since yet. Now we've just moved on to polyphonic, I, you know, with the Moog one, that's a massive leap for them. Um, so first of all, I think we need to all just shut up and respect that fact for a second. Uh, second of all, 
if you you know you're talking about a company that's heritage is laced in analog synthesis namely analog subtractive synthesis with a ladder filter to then say that they should embrace the digital world well first of all they kind of have with all the ipad apps and uh the digital controllers and I, I, for me they have a perfect mix um but in terms of you know uh digital vcos and wave shaping and whatever well if that's what you want just don't get a moog uh there are hundreds if not thousands of companies to choose from that have digital wave shapers and vcos so why are you just picking on that one company? I feel like if... I don't know Sebastian at all, so I, I don't know what he's like. He could be a lovely guy. But I feel like he's maybe misunderstood the heritage of Moog here. And I also feel like he's maybe looking at Moog from the wrong perspective. Because I know that owning a Moog comes with some clout. And it's seen as a very cool brand to... To have but that was never Moog's intention they're not I don't think they're out there to be considered cool uh, they're out there to make musicians happy um, and I feel like if you want them to go against their entire ethos just to make you happy in this one digital area I feel like maybe you've missed the whole ethos of the company so uh I, I you know i'm not i don't think i'm being negative about him i just think he's maybe misunderstood the situation um yeah so i i think the opposite i think moog do an amazing job and uh i think they have already embraced the digital world with uh digital control of analog systems which is huge um, and the transparency between the two systems for them is is like nothing else on earth. So uh, I honestly couldn't ask for more from them. When it comes to things like digital VCO and wave shaping, well, that's what we've got X for Serum for. Uh, you know, why why not just use X for Serum if if that's what you want, or native instruments, or whatever it is you want. I don't know. Uh, there's lots of people doing digital synths. I don't think it's right to call an analog company to call them out and ask them to do digital synths makes no sense uh <clears throat> you know it's equivalent to saying bugatti should make a budget car um that's not what they're about uh you said album would be more in uh the ep format uh have you thought about a trilogy based eps like atlas uh, did for scarlet scene sign sin eps even uh no i haven't and i i i'm struggling with just the one album let alone a trilogy so no uh did you try to make drum and bass before have you uh some production advice about it i have no advice other than concentrate on the mix i have done little bits of drum and bass but nothing commercially acceptable um and can't wait for your dead mouse remix video cool by the way i've just found my very first single on a great great label thanks for your advices through these videos uh, you are part of this success well thank you very much uh, although i'm sure you did it all yourself so well done uh, and uh, as you've said that drop a link if you can if youtube doesn't boot you out but uh, when it comes out let us know and I'll uh, publicly announce it. Uh, have a nice AMA and a good weekend. Thank you very much. And you, uh, not your human. By the way, how's the new label coming along? Any potential names? Uh, slowly and maybe and I'll announce more soon if I could be any more vague. Yanis Lukmelis, mixed down. High five. Fin Fighter, mixed down. High five. And I'm just about to hit the 30 minute mark. So hopefully I don't get cut off. Thank you very much to everyone who has listened to this one. We're probably into an hour. Uh, therefore, if you've made it this far in, you deserve an award. And I'm going to say to prove you've made it in this far comment the word time b 
because there's a video recommended here, Elon Musk's time management method. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, watching, listening, whatever it is you do. I hope it's all of use. Please do keep coming with these questions. Yeah, I did get cut off. Uh, please do keep coming with these questions. I love them. Uh, and yeah, have a good weekend. Six Nations rugby starts. So that's going to be good. And I'll see you this time next week. Cheers. Thank you.